Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. And we have a fabulous panel um, for you this afternoon or this morning, wherever you happen to be. And uh, looking very much forward to working with them in answering the really important question in today's very different market, what do partners really want from their vendors? So just waiting for our panelists to turn their cameras on and uh, we can get cracking. But as we do that, um, let me just start with a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, this is a panel, so very much want everyone to get involved, ask questions, make comments, um, which you can do in two ways. You can ask live via the microphone. So as you can see there uh, on your control panel, you can virtually raise your hand. Um, we can then unmute you and you can ask the question live or alternately use the question module and simply type in your question and we will take that question and put it to our panel. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our panelists for you. And our first panelist is Hanan Greenberg. Um, he's the SVP and General Manager of Technology for Model N. He's very much focused on helping companies maximize profitable revenue and channel engagement. He's been with Model N for 15 years, um, as, as I've said, as the SVP VP and General Manager of High Tech. He's worked with over 100 companies on pricing and channel incentives. And prior to Model N, he was the CEO and founder of Privia, which was focused on the government contracting space. And also CEO and chairman of Click Online, which was focused on online and multimedia product development. So Hanan, tell me just briefly a little bit about Model N. Thanks, Rod, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with this uh, very distinguished uh, panel of uh, colleagues from the industry. Um, Model N is a software company, 20-year-old software company based in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And we have two business practices, one focused on life sciences, the other focused on high tech. Uh, I lead the high tech side of the business. And there we focus primarily on helping companies uh, improve their engagement in the channel, manage um, very large uh, programs of uh, rebates, MDFs, price protection, inventory management, uh, as well as pricing and quoting in the channel. And last but not least, we also manage uh, channel data management for uh, many of the top 50 um, high tech global companies. Wonderful. And our second panelist is Dan Overgag. And Dan is managing director of the Spur Group. Um, he leads the firm's channel management, sales transformation and business operations practices. Um, Dan's got over 12 years industry experience. He's led countless strategic initiatives to large technology firms, advising on things like channel management, channel incentives, and helping drive efficiencies and develop new programs and portfolios. Dan loves the Pacific Northwest and taking advantage of the wide variety of outdoor activities available. And since he's been in quarantine, He's been spending time working in his yard and keeping his kids from destroying the house <laughs> alongside the dog, no doubt. So, Dan, a little bit about Spur. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists or uh, fellow panelists. And, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, Spur Group, we're a consultancy in the Pacific Northwest. We're located in Redmond and focus exclusively on go to market efforts. And, uh, accelerating a company's revenue you know we're pri primarily focused in the high tech space um and you know as, as ron mentioned i lead our channel management and our business operations uh practice areas and you know our channel management um practice area includes you know uh services ranging from you know incentive strategy to channel operations to program design to uh you know field enablement so i'm uh, excited to be here this morning Excellent. And our third panelist um, is Sal Patalano. And Sal is with Mind Matrix. Uh, he's a partner and uh, CRO for the company. 
And Sal's a serial entrepreneur. He's founded multiple IT companies. He's been on many sides of the industry. He's been an IBM business partner for over 15 years. Um, he's worked in the channel for many Fortune 500 companies, including companies like IBM, CA, and most recently Lenovo. He's listed as one of the top 100 most influential people in the channel. There's something to live up to, Sal. And he's a well-known public speaker, um, but also very well-known for putting a provocative twist on the things he's talking about. So, Sal, tell us a little bit about Mind Matrix. You bet, Rod. First of all, appreciate the invitation and um, delighted to be here in front of a great audience. And of course, always fun to spend time with the guys on the panel as we used to do face to face. Hopefully, we will again. My matrix um, is in the space of um, partner relationship management, PRM, a uh, big focus on channel automation, sales enablement, things like that. The company's been around, oh gosh, <clears throat> over 20 years, headquartered out of Pittsburgh. and um, we like to consider ourselves uh, one of the dominant uh, leaders um, in the PRM space and not to take away from the competitors, great companies out there, but we're just a little bit ahead and a little bit more focused um, on service and taking care of our partners. So uh, I'll throw that challenge, I'll throw that down for any of our competitors who are listening in on, listening in on the call. Bring it, bring it everybody, we're ready. Excellent, and our fourth panelist, is Mike Moore, and Mike is the VP of Channel Sales for E2 Open. Um, and Mike was formerly a channel and field marketing professional at Microsoft G Healthcare and Progress Software. Um, but Mike has also worked for three channel partners. So again, he understands both sides of the equation, the vendor side and the partner side of the house. He's also the author of one of the only books on channel marketing, Marketing Multiplied, a real world guide to channel marketing for beginners, practitioners and executives. And he's currently working with E2Open's channel customers to provide advice, coaching and best practices on the strategy and tactics associated with their channel programs. So, Mike, um, tell us a little bit about E2Open. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, uh, E2Open offers a channel management suite of applications. So everything from MDF, incentives, rebates, channel marketing automation, channel data management, and of course the managed services to go along with that. Uh, team brings a huge amount of expertise and history and experience. Uh, E2Open's probably the biggest channel player you've never heard of. Uh, the, the company has got its roots in supply chain, but has built an incredible channel management suite, uh, largely through acquisition. So companies like Birch and CCI, and uh, Averitech, where I came from, uh, have come together to be uh, this channel practice at e open So uh, a lot of experience in the team, and uh, it's our pleasure to join this panel today and share some best practices and things that we're talking to customers about uh, in these uncertain and uh, strange times that we live in. So thank you. Fabulous. So today's topic is, in today's very different market, what do partners really want from their vendors? And I thought we'd kick in um, with a couple of polls. Um, and so. Um, if we could start with the first poll, um, what is the single biggest request you're receiving from your partners today? So if everyone could pop in their answer um, and I can see people starting to vote, um, just click on one of those buttons. Let's get a feel for where we all are um, as an audience. So keep those votes coming in. Um, Got more than 50% of people who voted currently. Um, we'll keep the polls open for uh, um, another few seconds. So get those votes in everyone and let's see where we all stand. I think this is gonna provide really interesting information um, for everyone on the call. So just five seconds left. Um, anyone who hasn't voted, now's your chance. Um, get those votes in, click those buttons. And almost everyone has voted now. So I'm going to close the polls in just a couple of seconds and let's see where we are. So what's the biggest single request you're receiving from your partners today? 23% say financial help, 43% say marketing and sales support, 19% market sector insights and guidance, 8% um, extended product trials, deal regs, et cetera, 
and 7% um, something else. So um, perhaps I can start with you, Mike. Any, any thoughts or comments on the poll? Uh, yeah, I think the biggest thing that I would take away from the feedback here in the group is that uh, ultimately, you know, as much change as we're all dealing with and processing, some fundamentals still remain. Uh, ultimately, channel partners want help meeting more customers. And so whether it's the marketing and sales support or the market sector insights and guidance, they're trying to figure out, you know, who is moving forward still from a customer standpoint, who's looking to buy because they want to continue to try to grow their business. Um, so, so that's my biggest takeaway in, in this, uh, this poll. Okay. Anyone else want to chip in on that one? No, I'd agree with Mike. You know, I think the other interesting thing is I, I, I would imagine that this poll might shift a little bit depending on the, the, the customer segment served as well, because I think there are certain uh, industry segments that are more highly impacted than others that, you know, marketing sales support, you know, might be, you know, higher priority than, you know, market insights and guidance. So, you know, this, this certainly resonates. Excellent. I was just and, like to add, sorry, go ahead. Go on, Hanan. I just wanted to add to what uh, Mike said. Um, you know, I think that it's the more forward-thinking uh, that you know um, channels who know that their vendors have data they don't have, and by getting the insights, they can actually apply their investments in marketing and sales more effectively. And so, I actually, I think that these two elements actually support each other. It's almost like a force multiplier that if you knew where which segments you should spend your time on your sales and marketing investment will be significantly more effective as a channel. Yeah, and I would- and Sal, any final thoughts? I would, thoughts? I, would, I would chime in on that as well. The one thing that, that strikes me from this, I'm not sure if we did this poll a year ago, financial health would rank so high at 23%. Um, I'm not surprised marketing support, market insights, extended product trials, all of that makes sense to me, but it seems like financial health is ranked ranked highly, and I would, you know, I would of course write that off to the current COVID situation. Um, but again, Rod, I think that's something that would have been further down down the poll would be my, you know, would be my position anyway. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're going to have one more poll before we dig in some questions. So our second poll is: Where do you think your partners are struggling the most? And if you think they're struggling in more than one area, tick more than one box. So are they struggling with the move to digital marketing, the move to remote selling, the move to remote servicing and support, struggling with a hold on major IT projects or clients who are unable to pay them? So um, where are you hearing things the most? Keep ticking those boxes. And as I say, on this one, you can tick multiple boxes. So keep those votes coming in. We've got about 50% of the people on the call have voted so far. This will take just a moment longer because you've got multiple options there. So as I say, click the ones that are most relevant for you. So about 75% of people have voted. We'll keep the poll open for just another few seconds. Keep those votes coming in. We're going to close the poll in about five seconds time. Excellent. So let's see the results. So where do you think your partners are struggling the most? Well, the biggest one is the move to remote selling. 49% of us think that's a huge challenge. Um, next is the move to digital marketing. Then a hold on major IT projects. Um, clients are unable to pay them coming fifth and coming forth the move to remote servicing and support so sal you came on last last time how about um coming in and commenting on this one well again rod at the risk of kind of going with the flow here i don't i don't see anything surprising um the remote selling obviously is going to be the biggest pain point for us particularly those partners who are working more of a local market or you know extending out at not too great a radius if you will uh, the move to digital marketing i think has been an ongoing problem you know you could almost say all of the above with this and you know when you and i spoke a few days back i said it'd be nice to rank these and we've gotten a ranking on this now and i'm i'm not too 
I'm not too surprised with any of this. Um, remote servicing and support, that's what the partners do, right? I mean, they're, they're geared up to do that, so not surprised to see that low. Um, and I think digital marketing has always been an issue. So the move to remote selling, to me, I can see how that would be first and foremost. Not, not surprised at all. Okay. Hanan, do you want to come in on this one? No, actually, I, I agree with everything Sal just said, so I'll let someone else add. Anyone else want to chip in? How about you, Dan? Yeah, I, I, I you know, likewise agree. I think it's interesting that the hold on major IT projects, you know, that's, you know, a pretty high one, and it, you know, probably is reflected in the previous poll with the help on sales and marketing. You know, there's you just need to you know turn over more more rocks, and um, because there's more getting getting put on hold. Excellent. And so, Mike, let me come at you with this one with a uh, from a slightly different angle. If the problem is the remote the move to remote selling, what are you seeing your customers doing to enable that? What do you think um, the people on the call should be doing to help our partners? Uh, overcome the challenges of remote selling. Uh, yeah, I think it's funny because the uh, the the point that's being made there, you know, I'm just kind of backing up a step, you know, like coming into 2020, everybody was still talking about digital transformation, digital transformation, like whatever that meant, right? Um, and then, you know, Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, even said something about, you know, two years worth of digital transformation is taking place in two months' time. Uh, was kind of a well-publicized article. Uh, a lot of the customers that I talk to are looking at this and saying, maybe now we finally made the point to channel partners that they need to up their digital skills. Uh, if you, I wrote a blog article in the Averitech blog a while ago about uh, how events, face-to-face -face events, are not a marketing strategy, right? Like IT channel partners are known for just hosting a bunch of face-to-face -face events, steakhouses, luxury boxes. Isn't that marketing? No. Like those of us who actually embrace digital marketing know that that's not, not enough. So Sounds pretty good. The the customers, yes, many stakes uh, we can we can tell Sal. But the, uh, the the thing that we've we've tried to encourage customers to think about now is okay. Maybe now we finally captured channel partners' attention that they need to diversify, change their marketing mix a little bit, uh, and embrace some of the digital marketing tactics. So what's the best way to do that? Um, don't just kind of jam them into a product like ours and say go use the partner demand center and customize campaigns and launch it out. Put together a bit of a boot camp program. Uh, provide some instruction and some coaching. Give them real world homework assignment that they can do in your tools like a partner demand center. But then also bring them back to the boot camp session next week. Give them feedback, give them support, and then give them new homework assignments. So I think you really have to kind of put them alongside because in a pandemic, it's probably not the best time to try to get people to learn new skills. But it's a good time to be helpful, to coach people, to be alongside them and support them as they're trying to make this transformation. Yeah, <clears throat> if I might, <clears throat> Rod, excuse me. You know, Mike, Mike and I, I think, are in a, <clears throat> a somewhat unique position on this one because <clears throat> we're involved a great deal in channel sales enablement. It's part of what our day to day is all about. Um, and I think how, <clears throat> how you going to go about doing that is really critical because, to Mike's point, this is not the best time to sit someone down and say, "Hey, here's a, here's a new way to do something. Start adopting this." I don't think it's the best time for that. And I'm not always sure that even that's best done remotely. I'm not entirely convinced on that one yet, but I do think there are tools in the market today that will allow you to drive channel sales enablement and to do it effectively. And they're not terribly expensive. And all of us have had experience, and I'm sure that 75% of the folks listening in on this have as well. So I would encourage them, look to the organizations that have viable, well-tested, well-thought-out channel sales enablement programs, and they're out there. So I think I think Mike hit the nail on the head with that one. Well, just one one response to that too. I think, and, and this is again something that I'm telling uh, our customers is that because everyone in the world is going through this, uh, everybody's on a level playing field. So it used to be, well, I really have to keep doing this because our competition does this. Well, if everybody's back in their home office now that levels the playing field. And it also, we see people on network television every night uh, who are in their homes doing network news interviews and, and presentations, right? So the production bar has reduced as well. So that, that to me lessens the barrier to entry. Channel partners should be more willing to 
uh, to go and do something like a Zoom video and send that out to customers as a piece that they can drop versus having to hire a film crew and go through all kinds of expensive production because everybody's in the same boat. Mm. And Anne, you're nodding on that one. Do you want to come in? No, I was just profusely agreeing with what Mike said. <laughs> Excellent. And yeah, I was going to. I was going to comment. We're not right. selling. I Go think on. that you know, like Mike and Sal, you know, I think you're right that now is not a good time to try to push something. But I think now is a good time for vendors to be, um, you know, pretty magnanimous with with their with their you know enablement and with their learning libraries and with their content marketing and, and trying to open that up as much as they possibly can because now. If you're a partner now might actually be a really good time to start taking advantage of some of those things and you know upping the level as a partner and getting different certifications and getting adding different capabilities because it's a weird time and you know that's how you might survive is to broaden so you wouldn't want to certainly force something but now might actually be a really good time to enable that, that advancement and that training and that learning uh, for your partners yeah so push push on your vendors <clears throat> really yeah, exactly Exactly. Push on your vendors, and and if they're you know if they're not being responsive now, when you when you really need them, and I and I've been a vendor, right? IBM, CA, I get it, Lenovo. If they're not there for you now, there's a message yep. in there to be taken, and you have to determine what to do with it as a partner or, or those of you running businesses. But there is a definite message in there, and and now's the time to lean on them, and you're going to find the vendors who are serious about the channel are putting their money where their mouth is. And they're not just doing that by added discounts and things like that. They're doing it by providing you with what you really need. So the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And if you don't get oil, then it might be time to, to look around and consider other options. Well, and on that point, I think that the, you know, the, the brands, you know, I think a lot of channel partners think like, well, I'm just one of thousands and, you know, it's kind of nameless, faceless entity. You know, I don't know that I can go to a Microsoft or somebody like that and give them feedback that they'll listen to. And I think it's actually when you work for a brand like Microsoft, and I did for many years, uh, the you might get bits of feedback and you you crave it, right? You really want to hear from partners because for the one partner that took the time to try to break through and give that feedback directly to somebody who's running one of the programs, uh, there are probably tens or dozens or hundreds or thousands potentially of other partners who feel the same way. So you try not to over rotate on one piece of feedback, but oftentimes it is that squeaky wheel who's bringing up a need on behalf of the community that then you can socialize a bit and validate, make sure that other partners have that need. It's not just unique to them, uh, but then really make sure that you're tuning in a program to them. So uh, we talked to a customer a couple of weeks ago. They were saying, you know, I heard from a partner who wants to try podcasting, but they don't know where to start. You know, they're asking us for guidance and support because we have a corporate podcast. You know, how would I do something like that and scale it through channel partners? And, you know, that, that's a great opportunity when partners are especially looking to embrace, you know, podcasting is not new media by any stretch, right? But to some, it's new. Um, so how do you help them kind of quickly take a jump forward in a program like that? You know, that's a great opportunity for a brand to show a ton of empathy to the channel partners and help them with something that will benefit all of them in the long run. I agree. I do want to add one thing, if I can, which is there is some correlation between what we saw in the second question to the first. And when you think about things like, um, you know, the uh, projects being on hold, clients having difficulties uh, in uh, paying, and generally the the challenges of remote selling, and you think about the first question, which showed that the second thing on the list, 23% of the people spoke about financial aid. There is as as much help as we want to provide, we want to see the vendors providing the channels on enablement, on making libraries like uh, like uh, Dan spoke about available to them, helping them with new ideas on marketing, like Mike just said. We, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of the financial aid. It was number two on the list there, and um, and financial aid has many forms. It's not just about discounting, like Sal spoke about, but it's also about making sure that you're helping the channel see how your programs, your incentives are aligning with the segments that you know if they spend time there, they'll get a better return. So you're, you're really guiding them to where the dollars are with those programs, extending programs and extending funds. So you didn't, you know, you were unable to use all of your MDF funds, we'll extend it for another quarter or another two quarters. Um, because again, you know, all the things were important and, and money was number two on the list. So that's one of the ways that people can really help.
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Cash flow is really important for partners, and that's that's really struggle for them. Okay. And I've got backing up on that. I've got to keep those questions coming in because I'm getting quite a few coming through now. Um, so backing up on that, and I've got a, got an interesting question here. Uh, I know some of our partners need financial help, um, and some don't. Um, how do I differentiate between the two, um, and and how do I ever put that into a program? Well, I think that um, you know, I think that number one thing is if you have high quality data, and that's that's the big question is if you really have good insights and timely insights into their POS and the inventory, then you have everything you need to know about who really needs the help and who doesn't. Uh, because uh, those are the key leading indicators. If you have a, a channel that is successfully depleting their inventory at a great rate and uh, their POS is showing that the prices are where they are, you can create a very quick scorecard of which channels are having a real hard time in execution. And you can focus on the ones that you know are the ones where they're struggling. Now, they might be struggling because traditionally they were not doing a good job for you anyway. So you want to be able to not only look at the a specific point in time data, but you want to look at the trend of what was going on last year when everything was great. And if they, they were doing great before and now they really are struggling, those are the ones you want to pay attention to and see where you can help with the right programs and the right potential discounts, discount rebates, performance rebates, more MDFs, more enablements, whatever it might be that really helps them. Whereas there might be ones who are just not struggling and they're asking for it because, well, who wouldn't ask for it? And I give them a little less. And you can also weed out the ones that were never performing well and just because they're struggling now doesn't mean you need to actually help them. So data is where you're gonna find that information and you need to have high quality and timely data to make that information, those decisions effective. I mean, you know, John, just to, to jump on that, you're absolutely right. In my opinion, now is not the time to try to get to certain partners and fix them, right? Now is not the time to take that long tail that we have and to try to go in and fix it. It's the wrong time to do it. And I know there are people listening in on this call who don't want to hear that. I mean, there was a time where, you know, one of the companies I ran would have been considered a long tail many years ago. And, and you know, you want to be... You want to be sympathetic to what's trying to be done, but there's only so much resource, right? There's only so much water in the well, and and vendors have to be careful because it's very easy to get caught into that into that you know it's a whirlpool and it's it's a bad it's a bad situation. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit of channel. Very... Let's uh, just to chip right. on the end that you know it's a bit of channel Darwinism, right, Sal? You know where it's like. Uh, our friend Larry Walsh, a good friend of the channel focus community, you know, talks about this uh, quite a bit in, in normal times. He talked about it. But, yeah, if you're fixing people now, you, you are potentially committing unnatural acts to sustain something that isn't sustainable. And you're, you're potentially going to waste resources. So, uh, you know, I was just going through the PPP loan data uh, that was released uh, through Freedom of Information Act and just kind of looking by sector kind of how it broke down, it's delivered by state, or maybe there's a, a national file uh, for this program, but you know, uh, service industries, of course, were the number one segment that took money. And specifically then it's kind of lawyers and accountants are at the top, unsurprisingly. Uh, but you know, IT service partners are in there somewhere. Uh, I'm sure that enough of them got PPP loans uh, that, that needed that program here in the US uh, to sustain themselves for a bit. But some of them, it's kind of exposing uh, you know, if I can relate it to kind of the, the mask shortages and those kind of things we've had here in the U.S. hospital system, who knew that we didn't have a big warehouse somewhere by that, you know, they had inventory and that very quickly we were running out. So it's mm -hmm. kind of exposing, you know, a, something that wasn't prepared, uh, similar in the same fashion here in the IT industry, that there are many channel partners who instantly cash flow was a big issue for them. Um, so I think, you know, to Hanan's point, what we're seeing customers do is make those kind of extensions on MDF programs and then also look at things kind of related to the sales and marketing help that are needed, uh, giving opportunities to do direct pay on MDF. So like what if a channel partner doesn't have to lay out the cash to an agency to get the sales and marketing help they need and then submit a, com com a claim to get reimbursed and, you know, the 30, 60, 90 kind of whatever the time is there. What if as an agency... Uh, they're just getting paid directly by the brand, providing the support to the partner, and the agency can can collect, uh, you know, according to the claim process. It's a way to make the channel partner not have to put money out 
only to try to collect it back when they need to hold on to it just to make payroll potentially. So. Yeah, good point. Okay, and I've got a very specific question. Um, we're being pressured uh, to make changes to the timing on our deal reg and product trials programs. Do you think this is something we should be doing? I mean, hmm. the, uh, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, I think so too, but extending the, the deal reg timeline, so adding another 90 days or six, you know, 180 days, whatever the, whatever the case may be, but without a doubt, I agree with Mike. Well, I'll tell you that the story around Zoom, I think is, you know, Zoom quickly turned into Kleenex, right? People weren't talking about, you know, go to webinar or, you know, uh, all these other kind of tools like Zoom has become, you know, like in a very crowded space, they became the de facto product really quickly. And then when all of this started in mid-March, all of a sudden everybody was Zooming and Zoom CEO made a policy change and basically said Zoom is now free to all education institutions until the end of the school year when this passes, right? Quickly, they had to ramp up market share, security issues, all the kind of stuff that, that came after that. But I think uh, this is a time to show empathy. People are watching. People will remember how you and your company are operating during this time. And if you are digging deep into T's and C's to find reasons why you can't be a human being and be empathetic as a company, then people will remember that and how you treated them. So as long as it's reasonable, I don't think you do extend deadlines on deal reg or other things uh, if there's no good reason to, but I think if it's customer driven and need driven, uh, if you have, especially when you look at some of the research Larry Walsh has done at 2112 Group around um, the customers that uh, Dan made the point earlier about cer certain segments, industry segments are moving forward. There are solution areas in IT that are still moving forward. Larry collected some data on that, specifically things like, no surprise, remote work, IT security, you know, those are still high in, in fact, increasing demand because of the distributed workforce. So if you have partners who are serving that segment because that's where you deliver solution, then it makes a ton of sense to be more flexible on trials. Let's really make sure people are happy and satisfied and not endlessly, right? It wouldn't want to do a trial for a year or two, but if they need a little bit more time in trial, if they need more flexibility on deal reg to satisfy the needs of customers because everything is upside down, then why wouldn't you do something like that? Because your competition will, and so I'd rather be driving that change in the industry versus letting it happen to me and fighting it and then finally giving in when the rest of the market goes that way. I agree with you, totally. I think that if you don't, you, your, your competitors will, and, and that, that will be remembered. I think, you know, the, the relationships and what you do for partners now is going to have, you know, very long -term impacts um, with your partners. Okay. And here's a, a question that we could probably talk about for hours, but maybe I can fire this at, at, at you, Hanan. Um, and the question is, what key changes um, are the panel seeing um, in terms of incentive programs? And I think the thought behind that is what, what is being incented and how's that changing courtesy of the crisis um, versus the way it was before? And Hanan, I don't know if you want to step in on that one. Yeah. I think uh, I think there's two trends that I'm seeing, um, other than the ones that we spoke about already, like the extension of MDF programs and just being sensitive to to channel needs, which I think if you're not doing it, you should be doing it. And I am seeing a lot of companies already doing it. Uh, but if I look at the nature of the programs themselves, I think there's um, one and a half trends. Uh, one thing is uh, trying to create a better correlation between um, concessions and actual outcomes which is uh and i don't see a huge amount of pressure on it but i do see a desire of companies to try and uh tone down some of the discount rebating they're doing for specific deals specific customers and tie them more towards performance rebates both operationally simpler and um and uh with with some correlation to volume consumption I see a desire to do that. I think it's been put a little on hold because of current conditions and people still wanting to be sensitive. But generally, I'm seeing a trend towards um, more companies wanting to experiment on that front. What I am seeing very specific, and especially in this environment, is that some program definitions are actually getting very, very specific. Instead of being very broad term, sell a million dollars or something, I'll pay you two points. It's Here's a customer subset or segment that I really care about that I know we can either win more market share or make better uh, margins on, and therefore you, the channel, will do better on 
And I may still have some generic programs, but I will have an overlay that says, if you go and sell in this segment, this territory, this type of customer, this area in the marketplace, your payout will be significantly better. Getting more specific with those, I'm seeing an increase in those trends. And it does require a, you know, a, a more robust capability to, first of all, manage more of these programs that have become very specific in their T's and C's and be able to match the data coming in from the channels to, to, to validate them. But the companies who have those capabilities are doing a lot more of it because it is driving better results both for them and for the channel. So those are the one and a half trends I'm seeing. Okay. Anyone half else half. want to step in on that one? Yeah, yeah I'd, like, I'd like to jump in on that because we're seeing two that are very distinct. Um, the thing about my matrix is that we service, we don't, we don't just service the vendor side of the business, we service the MSP. We have two distinct offerings. And the reason I point that out is because we're, we're seeing trends coming in from both sides. And first, the trend we're seeing on the MSP side is we're seeing, and I think everyone's gonna jump on this, we're seeing a much greater interest in automation, particularly around marketing automation, to the point where we actually went into this thinking to ourselves during this, we probably see a, you know, some type of a decline in overall, you know, the funnel and the opportunities coming in. We're not on the MSP side. We're actually we're seeing an increase in the number of MSPs who are reaching out to us saying, "Hey, you know, we wish we had done this six or ten months ago." And I'm sure, you know, a lot of platforms, not not just not just us, but we wish we had done this. And all of a sudden, the result of that is we're seeing that side of the business become more transactional. In other words, we're not, we're not looking at the long cycle. So I think the move to automation, particularly in the MSP side, has started to take an upturn. We're seeing some trend. The second one we're seeing on the, on the vendor side, and I'd really love to hear what, what you guys think about this, um, a much bigger interest in ROI, more so than we, you know, was always there. It was always kind of knocking on the back door, right? But now it's being brought up in almost every single one of our larger vendor um, opportunities that you know prospects we're talking to. ROI comes up constantly. I mean, I just got off a call um, this morning, and I had another one yesterday where ROI was a primary focus of it. So, so, so when, you, when you talk about when you talk about ROI, you're referring to the ROI from specific programs or general ROI from the channel. It's actually it's actually broader, Hanan. It's the ROI and deployment of you know more channel automation from the vendors or okay. channel automating to the partner used to, I mean, we haven't seen it come up that much. Now, maybe that's because they're looking at their projects more carefully because of the spend and the budget, but regardless of why, the trend seems to be there, We're seeing it, so. Well, I think that's because having channel tools, you know, for a long time has been table stakes or for, you know, there's a maturity level you reach as a company where you have to have a partner portal, you have to have some channel marketing technology, mm. you have to have some, some infrastructure and tools, uh, but of course, you know, just like channel partners are facing a lot of pressure and cash flow, uh, some of the brands are as well, and they have to make those kind of difficult choices about where they're going to invest. So, should they run another uh, campaign through their, you know, the direct side of their business and the demand center team, or should they put more money into channel because channel partner is going to get the exponential growth that you know we all promise with the channel. Um, so yeah, we see that with customers too, and I think that you know, how they're kind of reshaping their programs in a lot of ways is is looking at uh, so much of the incentives that the uh, brands will align sit on the transaction itself, right? When a deal closed, we're gonna pay a rebate. When this, you know, sale or renewal or those kind of things. Um, what we're seeing and we're, we're uh, coaching customers on to a certain extent here is thinking about what are the steps that lead up to that, right? If the sales process has become elongated even further in your solution area, because of the pandemic, what can you do to incentivize channel partners to still go and build that pipeline and build out the opportunities so that when the sales eventually come, you can still incentivize that piece with rebates as well. But what are the, the leading indicators of behavior that are going to help drive us in the right direction? Because if we're all just sitting around waiting for the sale to happen and all the money sits on the sale um, and it's gonna take six months longer than it was before or even three months longer, uh, that's that's going to create some problems in the channel. So how do we keep them engaged, keep them participating in programs, uh, try to bring a little fun into life? Actually, there's a, a gal on uh, LinkedIn that I'm connected with. Um, she's doing a lot of direct mail kind of shipping of stuff out to channel partners right now. 
which, you know, direct mail, when did you think that was going to come back up, right? But people are all shut in their house. And, I, you know, you probably look forward to the Amazon Prime truck coming to your house every day, just like I do, because they yeah. come as often as the mailman at this point. Um, but, you know, isn't it fun when UPS or FedEx comes and brings something that you weren't expecting and it's a positive impression from your brand partner on, you know, some kind of program or something you participate in. So there is, despite what we're all going through, an opportunity to bring a little fun back into the channel and to get back to some tactics, uh, do personalized direct mail, those kind of things. Uh, people worry I don't have channel partner addresses. But if I sent Dan an email right now and said, Dan, I have something I'd like to send to you. Would you mind telling me the best address to send it to you? He would give it to me and I would send him something Who is nice. This? And how right? you find me? <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, it's like I'm not gonna send something bad to you. You can trust me with your home address, right? You know. Oh, so uh I think we're seeing more of that in the channel and people are trying to make those human connections and do that at scale as much as you can. Okay. Let me step in here, guys, because I've got a bunch of questions coming in. And I want to want to cover those. I think this one is is perhaps if I can direct this at you, Dan. Um, and it's, do you think that channel KPIs need to be adapted? Um, and if so, which ones? I think they do need to be adapted. I think that we are entering a, a you know, a new norm and a new way of doing business. And, you know, with the distributed workforce and, man, which ones? Um, Tough to say. I mean, it could be a lot of them. You know, one thing that I think is really interesting, I think it's going to be a kind of a fundamental shift that channel leaders are going to need to think about is their is their their partner management and their partner field teams because you know traditionally partners you know are either um, you know self serve through a portal or they got telesales and telemanagers or they've got account you know direct account managers and now that you know, most of that work has gone remote you know that that need for direct managers might be on the decline and so you might vendors may be thinking or rethinking about how they manage their partner channel and focusing more on a tele approach for the entire channel and I think that the KPIs and the metrics around their you know, their partner channel support systems are going to probably drastically need to be rethought and potentially changed. I don't know. That, that's like an immediate one that kind of came to mind for me. Okay. And Anne, do you want to come in on that one? KPIs, what, what, what needs to be changed? Um, I honestly haven't put enough thought into it. So I, I, would, I would primarily focus it back to ROIs, but not just limited to the marketing areas, but actually being able to articulate the KPIs of incentive programs and actually being more diligent at defining what they are when you're designing the program, not trying to measure them after the fact and see what worked, but actually be more diligent at setting, um, setting very specific goals for programs and then being able to very accurately measure them back. Uh, moving away from this sort of black box of I did a hundred programs, I got this outcome, but I don't really know which one of them drove which result. So that, that's the one thing I think is getting a little more specific. I think I think given the 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 high percentage rod that was given to remote selling, you know, maybe we we look at APIs, come back to that, right? Because that seems to be a problem that I think we need to keep our eyes on. And um, I guess there's two things I would look at given the difficulty of remote selling for partners. The first would be lead conversion as a KPI. I think I'd want to look at that and say, okay, you know, you were running a seven or an eight percent lead conversion, let's say on a SaaS product or out of trials or whatever it is we're measuring. If remote selling is really that difficult, then I think we might have to adjust that KPI and then help to get the number where we need it to be. And I think the second one is, I think we need to look at length of sales cycle because length of sales cycle will come directly back to ultimately all the numbers that we and the partners are interested in, right? Moving things through the funnel, you know, how, where are we engaging in the sales cycle? How much of a digital presence? How's the partner experience going? So if you put a gun to my head now and to Hanan's point without having given this much thought, but a knee jerk reaction, those I think would be the two, would be sales cycles, and lead conversion rates off the top of my head, and I reserve the right to change that 180 degrees in about an hour. I might add one too, jumping on Sal's point is, I think that, and Mike touched on it, you know, incentives are starting to move away from transactional. And I think that 
more and more solutions become either subscription-based or even consumption-based, the, the focus on the long-term value of a customer and the customer satisfaction is going to be you know, paramount. I think the KPIs and the metrics are over time need to start shifting toward customer satisfaction and, you know, re revenue recapture rates and renewal rates on subscriptions. Like, and that's got to really be, um, you know, as the solutions move more, more to that, to that model, that needs to be kind of paramount and front and center for, for vendors. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, Going yeah, back I, to that remote selling piece, because I think that's really, really important. It was the number one thing specifically. What can a vendor do to help a partner that's struggling with remote selling? Because um, I know I've spoken to a lot of MSPs. They're struggling with the fact that they used to turn up on the customer's doorstep, the potential customer's doorstep. They used to have regular meetings with the CEO of their key customers. Now they're having to do everything remotely. And, and there's a lot of struggle going on there. What, what can we specifically do to help them do that better video so you know everybody's got a webcam but not everybody uses it well or knows what to do with it um, so one of the ideas that i've been sharing with our customers is specifically around video uh, you know talking partners through the process of how do you sell through video right so there's kind of the face-to-face -face selling in a zoom call those kind of things how, how do you convey a degree of professionalism um, there's a favorite Twitter account that I have where they rate people's Skype room or something like that. It's called Room Raider, you know, and he kind of gives people score and kind of the background, right? You know, Dan gets bonus points for having a plant there, right? Um, so there's little kind of touches like that, but we, we're we actually recommending insofar as go and buy uh, a high def camera. Like I've got a nice Logitech one that sits on top of my monitor. I've got a Jabra headset that I love. It's wireless. You can hear me really well, right? I don't want to hear people yelling at their laptops during a call. Um, beyond that, kind of where does it go? Uh, there's a vendor that I love called Vidyard, V-I-D-Y-A-R-D. Um, they do, they have a nice little Chrome plugin. I can record a quick little video. In fact, the last time I did one of these for my colleagues, I still have the, the whiteboard, you know, hi Anissa and Joseph, right? I recorded a little video just internally because I wanted to explain something to them. I hold up the whiteboard as a way to catch their attention in the thumbnail, and then it gets a better open rate when the message is received. Not that I have a hard time with my colleagues, they're great. Um, but you get the point. I was trying to demonstrate the concept for them in a program that we're going to run here. Um, but it's those little touches. I think partners need a lot of coaching, not just use video in your sales, but specifically download the Chrome plugin from Vidyard, set up your account, create a little video. Here's what it looks like. Here's how to do it. Again, I really love boot camps and I ran a lot of those as a channel and field marketer. You know, partners need that kind of support and ongoing repetitions to be able to get the new behaviors and then to celebrate the successes, but also get feedback on the shortcomings if those, you know, take place. So that's that's my number one tip, you know, not that it's original. It's just, you know, again, people need help kind of putting the pieces together. OK, and I've got another great question coming in. What would you recommend for a newer company looking to grow um, and leverage the channel during this pandemic? How would they get Mindshare, recruit new partners, et cetera? So any tips for a, mm. perhaps a smaller company coming in in what is a very difficult time? Well, you know, Rod, there's, a, there's actually a, a whole handbook that has been developed by CompTIA. Um, for those of you who don't know them on the call, it's C-O-M-P and then T-I-A CompTIA. And they're a sort of an industry standards organization and when you go you can go read about them but i'm actually on their channel advisory board and over the last year or so um, the team has worked diligently to put together a handbook that does just that what are the questions you should ask yourself as a business what are the things you should know what are the litmus tests you should put yourself through how you should progress through the cycle what is the cycle for recruitment and enablement et cetera, et cetera. Um, for you as a as an MSP, how are you getting yourself spun up? Um, I would you know I would defer to that. I think the document may be overkill. There's a lot in it, but that's what CompTIA does. They take it to the limit. Um, you can pull from it the things you need, but you can go look that up. And I'm pretty sure it's available. And if it's not, if they haven't yet published it, you know you can certainly reach out to me via email, and I'll see when it's available, and I'll get you on the. Uh, Get you on a distribution list, but it's a really great document, A to Z. So, super. I think another thing that you know, if you're if you're 
looking to build or accelerate your channel, I think it getting crisp on your particular as a vendor, getting crisp on your particular partner value prop is really important. So, you know, really understanding where you play and how you play and in relation to your competitors, you know, because partners really look at kind of three core elements when they're thinking about who to, uh, who's, who solutions to, to go to market with, you know, their relationship with the vendor, you know, the momentum that the solution or the product has in the market. And then finally, the economics, you know, what's the, what's the potential upside for them as a So you as a vendor should be evaluating where you're at across all three of those measures and either addressing where there's deficits or amplifying where you feel like you've got, you know, you've got an edge and to make, to make your case for partners, because, you know, it's, it's a, it's a competitive world and you need to be you know clear about where you sit in it and, and to uh, uh, entice partners to, to come and sell your solutions. Yeah. I think uh, you need to pitch it just like you would pitch it to, uh, to investors because what you're really asking the channel to do is to invest, it's to invest, exactly. invest their resources, to get come up to speed about what your product does, what your service does, what is the value proposition. Uh, the more you can get it into a very condensed message of how it is particularly relevant to their position in the market, the kind of customers they serve, why now is a good time to open up this door because it opens up another revenue stream for them with some advantages where others might be slowing down right now. Uh, just making it very, very relevant and very crisp, just like you would any investor pitch. Okay, and got another question coming through. In fact, I've got bundles of questions coming through. So um, for any qu anyone whose question we don't get to, um, our panelists, um, and they're all sat sitting in front of you now, so here's putting them on the line, promise to answer those questions so we can post them um, by the end of tomorrow. So um, let me go through another couple of um, really good questions we've got here. Um, one of the questions I've got, and I'm trying, trying to word this in, in the right way. Um, I'm being told that trust is all important at the moment in the vendor partner relationship. Anyone got any really good ideas on how to build that trust? And Hanan, well, you were shaking your head, uh, nodding your head very frantically yeah. there. So perhaps if I can come in to you with that one. Sure. I think it, it ties back to many of the things that the team has already said. Um, it starts, first of all, with uh, are you coming to them with information that's going to help them? Okay. Mm -hmm. And that information come in many forms. It's, look, here's what I'm seeing across all my other channels. Here's an aggregated view. Here's how you might be differing in terms of performance, market focus, whatever, or product line focus, whatever it might be. And I'm giving you this information from across all of my channels to help you be more successful. That level of openness, that level of uh, education and insight that you're giving to them will go a very long way in building trust that this is a truly a two-way partnership, that you're invested in making them successful. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing, um, that would be uh, very relevant again is is all the um all the enablement you know now is the time you know the, both mike and, and dan spoke about this about now is the time to show the human side of this relationship and invest in if we had education libraries that before we would charge you something for or make it wasn't easy for you to get access for here's all the enablement tools here's all the content we've created here's how you can reuse them here's tips that mike was offering on how to use video or other things like that all these engagements that you're showing as an investment they're not a transactional uh, discussion they are really about helping i think is going to go a long way and and last but not least is putting your money where your mouth is and uh, and uh, aligning again the programs to where we think you're going to be successful, extending registrations, extending MDFs. You do all these things, you're going to build trust, and it's not trust just for now. It'll pay dividends into the future. Okay, yeah. and yeah. I'm going to finish with a final question. Um, uh, and I think again we could talk about this one for days. Never mind the next couple of minutes. Um, but the question is: remote selling equals remote purchasing. What kind of impact are you seeing marketplaces, i.e. Amazon, having on traditional vendor relations models? Now, there's a real Lulu for everyone. Who wants to come in on that one? Dan, do you want to take a little crack at that? Yeah, you bet. You know, uh, 
you know, it's it's interesting because this this topic and this conversation has you know really reared up in the last you know three four months and. Um, I don't know what the impact will be, but I think there is going to be an impact. I think you are going to see a, a, a resurgence, you know, within marketplaces and, you know, direct consumer and prosumer is going to become a larger piece of a vendor companies, you know, go to market strategy. And it needs to be. And because you're trying to enable, um, you know, a, a largely distributed remote workforce in, in a different capacity and different manner than you have in the past. So I think that is certainly going to be a mechanism that's going to be employed and is going to be an important one going forward. But I think we've seen even with the Zoom example again, you know, companies who who use this uh, as an opportunity, this circumstance as an opportunity to reduce the red tape and the bureaucracy in the procurement process. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like is it an opportunity to go back to your legal and your finance team and just say we need to cut the BS. We need to get to a click to sign type of agreement where customers can quickly move forward to onboarding versus drawing out the legal process. Um, just even in our own example, uh, when we were a Veritech, uh, we used to have terms and conditions in our contract. Uh, we moved to, a, took it out essentially, made it a, a master agreement that every customer contract referred to. And all of a sudden we stopped paying all kinds of legal fees, negotiating terms every time. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you just kind of use these opportunities and kind of these inflection points to make those kind of changes happen, then all of a sudden uh, you can get things maybe that you've always wanted from a sales organization standpoint, uh, where now finally the executive staff, legal, finance will prioritize those things to help you get through it so that you can just serve the needs of customers and help your channel partners grow instead of putting people through these kind of, well, that's the all way we've always done it kind of processes. We're pretty much out of time, but if I could ask each of you to very briefly uh, comment um, one really good idea that you've seen um, that'll help the people on the call um, do a better job of answering the needs of their partners. And Sal, maybe I can start with you. Yeah, it's easy. Transparency. That to me is the key. You know, partners are the same as us. We're the same as them. There's no no longer a delineation. We're in a small industry, even though it's global, the same people you see here, you're going to see there and who works for who and this and that. So the days of, you know, going, hiding the number in the back and giving it to the customer, those are long gone. Just transparency on all things you do, transparency. Mike. Yeah, we've talked a lot about what, you know, we should, so like, who are we to give you this kind of advice, right? Like, we're four vendors in the industry. We serve channel organizations. And so, you know, in the day-to-day -day work of all of us, we spend a lot of time talking to our customers about what they're hearing, what they're concerned about. And so I guess the biggest advice and kind of related to what Sal's saying is, you know, it's a transparency, but it's also seeking that feedback, gaining input from partners. Um, you're not always going to be able to do everything that they want you to do, but it's good to hear from them nonetheless, and then look at how you can take some of those as opportunities, prioritize them. It also, you know, unfortunately makes a really good stump speech later on for your CMO or your CEO to come back and say, you know, we collected your feedback and here's what you told us and here's what we're doing to change our business to better serve your needs, right? Like that's kind of every partner conference speech recipe. Um, as long as it's sincere and empathetic and helping not selling, you know, all the things we've talked about, it's the right thing to do. So I think really uh, bringing together your partner advisory council, not kicking it, you know, because you can't get together in person, but convene it online, get more of your execs on that Zoom meeting with your partner advisory board than what you would have been able to do in person because of the situation and hear more partner feedback, bring them in, trust them, they'll trust you back, it all kind of comes together. Okay, Hanan. I was on mute there. Uh, first of all, agree completely with everything Mike and uh, Sal said, so I won't repeat it. Uh, the only thing I would say is Right now, don't lose the momentum to continue engaging with your partners. Yes, there is a mess going on out there, but the world is not going to stop. Their business is going to be vital for your growth in the future. So now is still a very good time to invest in the channel. Maybe not doing new things. It's more around enablement. It's more about listening. It's more about transparency, but, but keep the engagements and keep the investment going. Okay, and Dan, last but by no means least. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that that um, the rest of the panel has said. I think the other, maybe the other piece of advice that I would offer is that, um, you know, no, as a vendor, no one knows your business and your space better than you. And, and you've got a, you know, you've got a channel there that offers you use that scale to your advantage and, and capture best practices and then push out those best practices as best and as fast as you can. You know, you're, you're, you as a vendor are going to be, you know, in better shape if all your partners are doing well. And so, you know, use the opportunity to collect best practices, share them out. Um, if things are working and, you know, over here, see if we can't replicate it over here and, you know, things of that nature and, and be, you know, empathetic and magnanimous with that information and, and transparent like Sal was saying. Fabulous. Sal, Mike, Dan, Hanan, thank you very much indeed for some great insights. If we didn't get to your question, as I say, our panelists have promised um, to get the answers um, and we will post those on the site tomorrow. But thank you everyone for attending. Thank you panelists for some great insights. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you Super. very much indeed. Thanks, Rod. Thanks everybody. Take Thanks, care, guys. Bye.